So it's our, our great pleasure to welcome David McPherson, who is Professor of Philosophy in the Hamilton Centre for Classical and Civic Education of the University of Florida. His publications include The Virtues of Limits, Oxford University Press, and Virtue and Meaning, a Neo-Aristotelian Perspective, Cambridge University Press. He will be speaking to us on the virtue of piety in medical practice. Professor McPherson, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Watt. Uh, and thank you all of you for coming out for this invitation uh, to talk about one of my favorite virtues, the virtue of piety. I think the virtue of piety manages to show, show up in a lot of my work uh, because I think it's a really important but also neglected virtue uh, in, in conversations today. And I think this is particularly true of the, Hippoc uh, the Hippocratic tradition. I mean, even contemporary defenders of the Hippocratic tradition tend to sideline, marginalize, or at least underemphasize uh, the role of piety within the oath. And so, uh, so, so this this essay I wrote was part of a contribution to a symposium on Ta Tom Cavanaugh's book, Hippocrates' Oath and Asclepius' Snake, The Birth of the Medical Profession. And um, so it's kind of a beginning point of, um, there's some future work I'd like to do uh, on uh, potentially developing a Hippocratic virtue ethic possibly with uh, my friend here, Xavier, who just uh, jumped on a, a minute ago. Uh, we've been we've been talking about this. Um, so anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll present this. Um, I have a PowerPoint here and uh, then we can have hopefully a, uh, what I'm sure will be a good conversation. So let me start this <clears throat> from the beginning. So this is uh, Kavanaugh's book. I think it's a really excellent book. Uh, you know, I, he asked me to contribute to the symposium, so I had to come up with some criticism. But largely, I agree with most of the book. Uh, I think it's just a, a difference of emphasis. And so let me um, begin with uh, what the central claim of his book is that the Hippocratic Oath responds to what he calls the problem of itrogenic harm. Okay. So... Harm that is itrogenic, uh, that is from the Greek itros, meaning physician, and genos, meaning born of, is harm that is caused by a physician. The response to this problem, he says, inaugurates medicine as a profession. Uh, this takes, uh, this, this itrogenic harm can take three forms. The first are wounds that are ineliminable from the work of healing, for example, cauterizing to stop bleeding. Uh, many forms of healing involve uh, some some harm uh, intended, you know, it might be breaking a bone to reset it. Uh, they're ineliminable from the work of healing, but they're not seen to be objectionable. Uh, then there are harms that are the result of physician error, uh, for example, giving the wrong dose of a drug. And then lastly, there are wounds of what he calls role conflation, for example, euthanizing a patient or assisting in suicide. He writes, in the last type of wound, the most problematic, a physician adopts the role of a wounder by deliberately injuring, thereby abandoning the practice of medicine as a therapeutic, uh, exclusively therapeutic activity. Uh, so clearly it's going to be this last form of, uh, of itrogenic harm that's the most problematic. So while medicine should certainly seek to minimize harms that result from physician error as far as possible, the Hippocratic Oath Kavanaugh maintains responds above all to the profound threat of role conflation that sorry that role conflation poses to medicine by means of the oath Hippocrates founds medicine as a profession devoted wholly to therapy explicitly excluding deliberate wounding so he actually you know has uh, fairly extensive reflections on sort of the sort of ambiguous power of medicine that there's the, the healer wounds uh, that there's a sort of threat lurking in the background of the healer and you see it kind of in the traditional image of, of, of medicine, you have this, this snake on the rod uh, posing uh, a potential threat, uh, but also, uh, you know, the possibility of healing. So how do we sort of rule out uh, the, the potential for uh, role conflation uh, within medicine, whereby the healer deliberately wounds? So first of all, those who take the Hippocratic oath solemnly pledge to act for the benefit of the sick to the best of one's ability, and regard this as the proper end of medicine. Secondly, and relatedly, the oath forswears deliberately causing harm and specifies three major types of harms to be avoided, intentional killing, sexual exploitation, and violating confidence. 
So um, as he points out, the oath does not offer comprehensive ethical guidance, but rather it establishes the boundaries within which ethical medicine takes place. As Kavanaugh points out, horkos, the Greek word for oath, is related to herkos, fence, which, uh, which is that which encloses. The act of taking the oath establishes medicine as a profession with its own internal ethics centered on the golden, me uh, golden uh, medical rule, help and do no harm. Okay, so um, I thought uh, for a possible book project to beginning with uh, Chesterton's famous discussion of the fence uh, in the middle of a road. Sorry, I think my email might be on, so I'm going to shut that off. Um, where he says, if you're thinking of reforming something, uh, you you know, if, uh, you should go away and think why it might have been put there in the first place. We get this image of a fence. Maybe you want to go tear it down. It's placed in the middle of the road. Uh, you should go away and think about it rather than tearing it away straight away, even though it may seem like a monstrosity put up in in in, in the front of a road. Well, I think this, you know, idea of uh, the oath as a kind of fence, uh, you know, so, sort of is uh, suggestive of the same Chestertonian thought, because when we look at the oath itself, um, let me uh, go back to our, when we look at the oath itself, for many people who first encounter, it seems seems rather strange. Um, you know, we we have beginning with sort of swearing by the Greek, Greek gods here, um, and this sort of uh, relationship between uh, the teacher and their students, where they're regarded as sons and so forth. But um, I won't go into detail. Uh, Kavanaugh in his book has a nice sort of uh, way of sort of um, sort of uh, 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 assigning these different parts of the oath in, in a helpful way, as I have there on the screen. But um, the main thing we're focusing on here is, is sort of the red part and the purple part, as I have them highlighted. Uh, in the oath that uh, the the person who takes the oath will use regimens or, or healing remedies for the benefit of the sick, according to the best of one's ability, and what is used for harm or injustice, I'll keep away from the sick, I'll neither give a deadly drug to anyone, though having been asked, nor will I lead away to such counsel, and similarly to a woman, a destructive pessary or abortive remedy, I will not give, but purely and piously, I will watch over my art and my life. So uh, it's there particularly that we get uh, reference to piety. So we'll come back to that shortly. So um, a kind of so this is not uh, this is this is McPherson, not Kavanaugh. But uh, so what I want to bring out here is what I call the moral specialness of Hippocratic medicine. Uh, and I think uh, a key sort of takeaway here is I think we're going to recover a Hippocratic approach to medicine. Uh, we have to fight against the sort of tendencies or pressures towards a kind of disenchantment in, in contemporary life generally, but also to, in, in the practice of medicine. Uh, and so uh, it's particularly because I think Kavanaugh does not do enough to resist this uh, that, I, that I find some problems in his account. So what do I mean by disenchantment? Disenchantment is just the, the sort of perceived loss of meaning or value. Uh, we think of this term as related to Max Weber. But it's a kind of flattening of the moral universe, we might say. And I think we see this particularly in emphases uh, on quality of life or reduction of suffering and on uh, focus on autonomy. Whereas what I want to argue is that uh, the, the Hippocratic Oath is centered on a claim about the sanctity of human life, where the, the virtue of piety has a central role to play. OK, so let me let me bring out three points with regard to the moral specialness of Hippocratic medicine. So first of all, it responds to a situation that is morally charged. It's an encounter with a sick person who is vulnerable and in need of medical help, or it could be an injured person as well, I should add there. Uh, and sometimes they're in particularly dire need where life itself and not just health is at stake. In taking the Hippocratic Oath, one publicly and solemnly professes before all those who may find themselves in this condition, which is all of us, that he or she is there to help and not to harm, and so can be trusted to care for our medical need. This means that the me uh, that medical practice cannot be regarded as a morally neutral skill or know-how that can be used for diverse and incompatible ends. The Hippocratic medical profession has its own internal ethic defined by its, its, its exclusively therapeutic aim. And then lastly, it's shaped by a solemn promise that responds to the special dignity or sacredness of every human life. The recognition of the special dignity or sanctity of human life 
is in fact part of what makes the medical encounter a morally charged situation. So to assert the moral specialness of medicine, as, as I mentioned, requires taking a stand against the contemporary pressures towards disenchantment, uh, again, this sort of threatened loss of meaning, including in the realm of healthcare. My criticism of Kavanaugh is that he underemphasizes the central role of piety within the Hippocratic ethic, and so accedes too much the prevalent disenchantment of our times. So I should say largely, I mean, so this goes back to my first book, The uh, Virtue and Meaning, A near Aristotelian Perspective, uh, where I'm sort of uh, likewise fighting against sort of tendencies towards just disenchantment in neo-Aristotelian virtue ethics. So this is a tendency, for instance, to focus on uh, human flourishing understood on analogy with the flourishing of other living things, um, where um, uh, which I think sort of loses a lot of the meanings that sort of motivate us from a first person standpoint. So for instance, you don't have in contemporary virtue ethics much discussion of uh, say human dignity or the sanctity of human life. Uh, it's sort of off the map because everything's about what are the things we need to do in order to flourish uh, as the kind of creatures we are. Again, it misses the sort of realm of um, what I call strong evaluative meaning, drawing on the work of Charles Taylor, which is meaning that involves sort of uh, qualitative distinctions of higher and low, lower, noble and base, sacred and profane, and so forth. So we can get more into that, but that's a little background to uh, you know some of what I'm criticizing. And, and I, I think it's not just in Kavanaugh, but in others who defend a neo-Hippocratic uh, virtue ethic. I think you see this, um, uh, for instance, in uh, Far Curlin uh, and uh, Chris Tolfson's book on the way of medicine, which is another great book, but I think it, again lacks this emphasis on some of these thicker ethical concepts like the sacred. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit on that point on the virtue of piety. So what is the virtue of piety? As I understand it, it's the virtue of being properly responsive to what is sacred or reverence worthy, which includes human life. It also seeks to be properly responsive, responsive to the sources of our lives, such as our parents, hence we can speak of filial piety and the God or, in God, or the gods uh, in the Greek context, Hence, we can speak of religious piety. Being properly responsive here will involve showing reverence for human life and its sources, which includes recognizing the claims of inviolability with respect to human life, since what is sacred is set, up, set apart and placing boundary markers on, on what we are allowed to do with respect to it. For instance, we are not allowed to destroy human life intentionally. This is absolutely ruled out. So in The Virtues of Limits, which my, is my most recent book, I defend absolute prohibitions. Uh, on the basis of uh, the, the value of the sacred. I think if we want to make sense of absolute prohibitions, it has to be done on the basis of some claim about something being sacred or inviolable. And I think sacred is just a way of getting at inviolability. Uh, it's a sort of thick ethical concept that helps us to grasp the idea of inviolability. And so we can, again, these are all things we can take up more in discussion. Okay, so uh, Kavanaugh on piety in the oath. Um, so it's not that Kavanaugh ignores uh, the sections on piety in the oath. In fact, so he goes through each part of the oath. And of course, he discusses, therefore, the mention of piety, which is I, which I've already referred to, uh, where Hippocrates says, I will neither give a deadly drug to anyone, though having been asked, nor will I lead away to such counsel. And similarly to a woman, a, a destructive pessary or abortive remedy, I will not give, but purely and piously, I will watch over my art and my life. So this, of course, is the most controversial passage in the oath today. We tend to have revised versions of the Hippocratic Oath that don't mention these things, uh, sort of uh, hollow out some of its moral content, um, because, again, it takes stand on uh, several obviously important moral controversies about uh, euthanasia or assisted suicide or abortion. Uh, Kavanaugh notes that the forswearing of euthanasia, assisted suicide, and abortion, the oath cannot properly be understood absent the jurors, concluding reference to purely and piously uh, guarding his life and art. So he writes, this is Kavanaugh, the Greek word for purely, hognos, coming as it, as it does after reference to not giving a deadly drug and not giving a life-destroying abortive, indicates that the oath here addresses purity from blood guilt, that is, the oath taker forswears killing and thus will be pure before all the gods and goddesses in this respect. This sense of being free from blood on one's hands before the gods becomes even more pronounced when one uh, considers the uh, com complimenting worth uh, for that here translated as piously, 
hasios. Uh, dikaios re refers to human justice. Hasios refers to righteousness before and with the gods. Uh, Kavanaugh also remarks that the oath features a religious sensibility that forswears killing, including inchoate human life. Uh, so I think that's those are important remarks, uh, but I think what we find is in fact that this religious sensibility drops out when Kavanaugh comes to defend the continued validity of the oath's prohibition against intentional killing in chapter three of his book. Um, so what I want to contend, though, is that a, re uh, that a religious, or at least what we might call a quasi-religious sensibility that gives recognition to the sacred or the reverence-worthy is crucial for the viability of a Hippocratic ethic, ethic, and indeed, it is constitutive of a Hippocratic conception of the medical profession. In other words, if, if we feel like we can't talk about the sacred or the reverence-worthy, then I think we simply have to give up a Hippocratic ethic. I think we should just be honest about what it requires uh, and, and either go full throated and, and seeking to defend it or else just uh you know abandon it altogether. I wanna I wanna go the direction of defending it. So while one does not need to be religious in any traditional sense, for example, being a theist of a particular stripe, in order to accept this sensibility, what is required is an affirmation of the reverence worthiness of human life, where this is understood as setting limits upon our will. The main reason that Kavanaugh provides for upholding the oath's prohibition of intentional killing by physicians is that one cannot care for another by destroying the, that other, even at his request. Therapy, caring for a subject, requires a subject to exist so that he may receive one's care. Killing uh, performed by a doctor is oxymoronic, a practical contradiction. So Leon Cass also makes a similar remark along these lines when he says, there is no benefit without a beneficiary. So it's a kind of practical contradiction. However, I think Leon Cass actually does do more to recognize the role of the sacred uh, in making sense of that. So I'll come back to that uh, point shortly. So Kavanaugh also gives five additional reasons um, for, uh, for this prohibition against intentional killing, uh, defenses of this. Uh, first, he says, killing by a physician undermines patient trust and it re renders ambivalent the deaths of patients that do not that, that do at times occur in the normal practice of medicine. Killing by physicians can wrongly medicalize existential distress to lack control over the time and manner of one's death partially defines the human condition. To regard this lack as a disease in need of a healer's tr uh, treatment errs fundamentally. Killing by a physician jeopardizes the welfare of vulnerable others, rendering them too susceptible to this injury. By killing or assisting in the killing of patients, a physician indicates to reasonable others that having that disorder is a good reason to be killed by oneself or others. By assisting a patient's uh, suicide or by euthanizing a patient, a doctor suggests that killing solves human trials and tribulations. Recourse to killing will retard the development of medicine as an art. So we see that as a solution. We won't seek other solutions. And then lastly, by killing even in a putatively therapeutic manner, the physician undermines medicine's ability not to be suborned to, into killing more generally and for diverse purposes. Okay. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic with all these reasons. I think there's a lot to be said here. But I think, again, what's striking is what's not said, namely that the physician ought not to kill because it violates the sanctity of human life and so would be impious. Without this, I want to explain there's difficulty of absolutely ruling out killing by physicians. Okay, so why we need pod piety. Again, consider Kavanaugh's main reason for opposing killing by physicians. Therapy, caring for a subject, requires a subject to exist so that he may receive one's care. Killing performed by a doctor is oxymoronic, a practical contradiction. Again, that's uh, Cass, as Cass puts that, there's no benefit without a beneficiary. This makes sense, I think, if we've already accepted the Hippocratic conception of the medical profession and with it, its particular views of what caring or healing consists in, including what limits or fences should be put around it. But as Kavanaugh acknowledges, there are rival conceptions of the medical profession with different views of the healing mission. In particular, he discusses rival uh, Apollonian and Asclepian views. Quote, the Apollonian physician will harm outright when doing so putatively reduces overall harm. The Apollonian physician, uh, physician's injuring in order to reduce harm assumes a divine character. 
The Asclepian includes killing and thus acts somewhat divinely while proposing that is not inju injurious, but rather beneficial. So uh, the Apollonian and Asclepian physicians play God in not accepting any fundamental limits on what one can do to reduce suffering. They only disagree on whether killing to reduce suffering is to be described as a necessary injury or as in fact the benefit. So either way we have it, uh, it's, it's sort of the same idea that one can be justified in killing in order to reduce harm. Here we have a conception of healing that, uh, healing that are centered on reducing suffering and promoting quality of life. If someone is terminally ill and suffering greatly, such views would regard euthanasia and assisted suicide as forms of healing. In addition to this quality of life conception of healing, there are also autonomy-centered conceptions of healthcare that are primarily concerned with respecting people's autonomous choices with regard to their health care, which may involve deciding to be euthanized or assisted in, youth, uh, in suicide or undergoing ab abortion procedure. Again, these are sort of rival conceptions of the medical practice. Should, and so I think the question, the question here, oops. Okay, somehow I have, uh, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna, so have you lost my, my screen sharing here, I assume? Let's see, there it is. Can you see it now? Xavier, do you see the, is it back to the PowerPoint? Uh, we're, I'm seeing um, hmm. the Wi Fi is needed slide um, at the moment. Okay, uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. So I clicked on something accidentally, and it, for me, anyways, it went to something else. Okay. All right. Um, so the question here, I think, uh, is should medical practice be centered on quality of life or suffering reduction, autonomy? Or the sanctity of life. I'm not suggesting that even if you accept the sanctity of life view, you, you're not going to be concerned with autonomy at some level or with quality of life. But there is a question with these competing views of, of medical practice and of the healing mission of healthcare, which should sort of ha be our sort of guide, guiding star, so to speak, right? Uh, and so I take it that um, I take it that the Hippocratic tradition. Um, is best understood as being guided by the sanctity of human life and therefore also by the virtue of piety, which makes demands both for treatment that helps to restore someone to bodily health as far as possible and to avoid playing God by intentionally harming, including above all killing. This forms the basis of the practice of oath taking that constitutes medicine as a profession within the Hippocratic outlook. Indeed, Kavanaugh goes on to discuss how oath-taking is fitting when we are dealing with particularly weighty matters or vital affairs. Medicine addresses our susceptibility to illness, decline and death, and our associated need for therapy. Caring for humans as being subject to wounds, vulnerable, constitutes a weighty doing. Medicine has the gravity necessary for the solemn practice of oath-taking. Hence, physicians fittingly uh, take oaths. Indeed, uh, we can and sh should say that the weighty matters are weighty precisely because they concern the sanctity of human life, and thus we rightly recognize medicine as a solemn undertaking having real gravitas. But again, I think this requires recovering and defending a religious sensibility, or at least a quasi-religious sensibility, that forswears killing, including inchoate human life, because of recognizing something sacred or reverence-worthy about human life. Okay, so this is where I'm going to appeal to an old friend, Elizabeth Anscombe. Um, so Elizabeth Anscombe, in her work, her later work in particular, uh, discusses what she calls the religious attitude towards human life. She writes about this attitude of respect before the mystery of human life, or what I've called the sacredness or reverence worthy of human life. And she says it is not necessarily connected only with some one particular religious system. And she goes on to remark, a religious attitude may be merely incipient, prompting a certain fear before the idea of ever destroying a human life and refusing to make a quality of life judgment to terminate a human being, or may be more developed, perceiving that men are made by God and God's likeness and to know and to love God. So that's a more distinctly religious flavoring, but uh, this refusal to make quality of life judgments to see there is something inv uh, inviolable uh, gets at this religious attitude towards human life. Elsewhere, she also speaks of a uh, speaks of mystical perception, uh, uh, which is another way of articulating a religious attitude towards human life, uh, or what uh, we can also call a sense of the sacred or the reverence worthy. 
Anscombe thinks that this perception is, in fact, as common as humanity. For example, we find it in the perception that we dishonor our bodies in casual sex, in our sense that we owe respect to someone's dead body, and in the horror at the evil of murder. So just to kind of pick up on the, the sort of sexual example, and people often make this argument with regard to what so, you know, people say that, for instance, sexual violence is, is a grave form of wrong and the right to do so, but they have difficulty articulating it simply on consent grounds alone. On consent grounds alone, and we don't know why it's so wrong compared to other violations of consent. And so the argument being here that uh, there's something sacred uh, that's violated. Um, and so similarly, I think to make sense of the wrong of murder, uh, we have to, uh, it's, it's not enough simply to talk about how it robs someone of future enjoyable experiences, or even that it violates autonomy. Rather, the horror of the, this evil is that it violates the profound intrinsic value of human life. That is, it violates that which should be regarded as inviolable. So the general point is that we need a religious or quasi-religious sensibility regarding the sanctity of human life to make sense of common moral judgments. Um, so, I mean, we, we could a quibble over this term religious. I'm just picking up on, on Kavanaugh's term and also Anscombe's uh, uh, discussion here. But essentially, we're, by religious, we just mean a sense of the sacred, right? Uh, it's 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 where that that sort of moral category has uh, salience in one's moral outlook. Uh, I think we can call that religious, or at least a quasi-religious sensibility. Okay. So um, I think perhaps the most difficult case from, you know, if we're wanting to defend sort of the the, the full tilt of uh, of Hippocratic ethic is, is with regard to abortion. So let me just go back there. Um, so I think um, um, if we, if we look at abortion, I mean, I think there's an argument here that, that people who are pro-life often make just based on equality. I think it's a very compelling argument that attempts to affirm equal, uh, human equality that distinguish between uh, persons and non-persons or between uh, kind of biological humanity and moral humanity end up undermining claims of equality. Uh, uh, our human equality is, I mean, we can't, personhood is not something that can come in degrees. Uh, so, it, you know, it's either uh, we believe in human equality or we don't. So um, so I think there's, a, there's an important argument there, but it still is a case that many have difficulty seeing uh, early human life as fully amongst us. So I think um, what we need is to cultivate um, a sense of awe and reverence before the sheer fact of human existence, which again is a kind of religious or quasi-religious sensibility. And this is uh, something I've developed more in an article of this title called Transfiguring the Unborn in Public Discourse. So if you wanted to read that, you can just Google Transfiguring the Unborn Public Discourse and you can find that. Um, but uh, here I want to appeal to um, uh, G.K. Chesterton on awe and reverence before human life. So what is it to cultivate a sense of awe and reverence before the sheer fact of human existence? This was something that uh, occupied uh, Chesterton quite a bit, and I think he has some some beautiful passages on this point. So one of these uh, passages is from Orthodoxy, where he says, the things common to all men are more important than the things peculiar to any men. Um, man is something more awful than men, something more strange. The sense of the miracle of humanity itself should be always more vivid to us than any marvels of power, intellect, art, or civilization. The mere man on two legs as such should be felt as something more heartbreaking than any music and more startling than any caricature. In other words, there is a wondrous preciousness to human life as such, and the miracle of humanity is that we should exist at all. Or as we might also put it, the wonder is that there should be a universe and that it should give rise to beings with rational natures, that is, we should be part of the universe, able to stand up, look around, reflect upon the world, and appreciate it. There is surely here, if anywhere, something worthy of awe and reverence. Later in Orthodoxy, Chester also brings out the sheer gratuitousness, gratuitousness of and wondrous preciousness of existence when discussing uh, Robertson Crusoe, which is his favorite uh, novel from his childhood. Uh, and he's discussing a part where uh, the novel lists things that were saved from the wreck of Crusoe's ship. And he comments, it's a good exercise in empty or ugly hours of the day to look at anything, the coal scuttle or the bookcase, and think how happy one would have, could have been to have brought it out of that sinking ship onto the solitary island. 
but it is a better exercise still to remember how all things have this hairbreadth escape. Everything has been saved from a wreck, that is the wreck of non-existence. Men spoke much in my boyhood of restricted or ruined men of genius, and it was common to say that many a man uh, was a great might have been. To me, it is a much more solid and startling fact that any man in the street is a great, great might not have been. So the idea here is that any of us might not have been. So uh, it, the wonder is that any of us exist at all, right? And so if, uh, sort of the point I want to take of this is if we can say this of any human being in the street, then we can say it also of any human being in the womb. So to cultivate this sense of awe and wonder before the sheer fact of human existence, I think is precisely what's needed by, uh, required by the virtue of piety and also required uh, to, to defend the Hippocratic prohibition on abortion, right? So again, this is where I think uh, the virtue of piety uh, is central to, uh, we shouldn't, shouldn't sort of set it aside because it constitutes uh, the Hippocratic medical profession as the kind of profession it is. So I think it has to be understood as rooted in this kind of, this sense of awe and reverence before human life. Okay, so uh, coming here to uh, a conclusion, uh, conclusion, I think an another thing that needs to be emphasized is um, that the practice of taking the oath itself can be a way of uh, transfiguring medical practice around a sense of the sacred. So uh, it's partly um, the, the sort of solemnity of the oath uh, by which we can come to appreciate it. So, um, so uh, the oath in the medical profession that rises out of it are not simply based on a belief in the, the sanctity of human life, but rather the sense of solemnity that it cultivates also helps us to a better appreciate the sanctity of human life. The oath and the profession falling from it, uh, in other words, are revelatory. They enable a transfigured vision whereby the reverence worthiness of, of human life can come into view. This is a, a revelation that depends upon enactment of this reverence worthiness through treating human beings as reverence worthy. So, I mean, this this is a, a point that I think you can find, I don't, um, I don't know how many are familiar with Cora Diamond's work, uh, but she'll talk, for instance, about manners, having a kind of revelatory aspect. I think oath-taking and sort of the practice of living by one's oath within the medical profession has a kind of revelatory aspect where it helps us to appreciate, sort of opens our eyes to sort of the reverence worthiness uh, of, of the human beings uh, one is there to help. Okay, so let me uh, conclude um, with this passage from Hippocrates on the relationship between medicine and philosophy. Uh, this is from the Decorum. He writes, between medicine and the love of wisdom, that is philosophy, there are no great differences. In fact, medicine has all the things that lead towards wisdom, dislike of money, reverence, modesty, reserve, sound opinion, judgment, calm, steadfastness, Purity, not knowing speech, knowledge of things useful and necessary for life, dispensing of that which uh, cleanses, freedom from superstition and preeminence divine. So the idea here is that medicine is a, like philosophy, the ancient conception of philosophy. It's a way of life. Uh, philosophy, think of, you know, going back to Socrates as care of the soul. Um, the medicine is a kind of care of the body. Uh, Socrates and Plato often deploy that, that analogy, but we can take it the other way. Uh, and say that it's a care of the body that should also lead to a kind of care of the soul, one that uh, sort of dealing with the stuff of life as one does in medicine leads us to sort of uh, the larger questions about our, our, our human existence, our place in the larger whole, uh, the sort of thing that I think piety is concerned with. And so I think there's a sort of link here between medicine, philosophy, and piety, or reverence as it's put in this passage. So with that, uh, I want to leave some time for discussion. I tried to cover sort of the, the main points here, uh, but I want to leave some, uh, some uh, I think there's a lot of material here still to, uh, to be discussed. So thank you very much for, for your time and look forward to, to talking.